Uh, she's professor at Fudan University in um, Shanghai, in China. And um, her main research area are Marxist philosophy, history of the Western philosophy, and critical theory. She's, she has authored and co authored two books, and she has also published many papers in Chinese and in English to welcome to the lab forum, Shanghai. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, so, about the topic. What's the present condition of the anti Excuse me, try to talk a little bit closer to the microphone. Okay, sorry. What's the present condition of the anti capitalist movement in China? I would say that it's almost impossible for me to give a direct answer to this. What's the reason? Because, on the one hand, there seems to be no the same kind of movement in China. We do not have that kind of real organized workers' movement in China. And even though Marxism is still the ideology of their government, then there are a huge amount of scholars doing studies about Marxist works, but this does not really result in this kind of anti-capitalist movement. So back in China, as a teacher, I have always been faced with a question from my international students. And they will ask me, I'm here, and I am told by the Chinese government that you are doing the socialism with the Chinese capitalists. But why can I only see capitalism here? Mm -hmm. And I think that this question has often been echoed by the comments from my own Chinese colleagues. And they will say that it's a very witty comment. They will say that the so-called Chinese characteristic is just capitalism. Mm -hmm. So what we are now doing is capitalism. But in this paper, I will say that at the same time, there are indeed voices of anti-capitalism in China. But they come from different directions, and they are interconnected in many different complicated ways. So I will try to give a picture of these different voices. And then finally, I will try to touch on the weak side of this picture. And who are these voices, or what are these voices? Firstly, we still have those old left who are criticizing capitalism using the traditional official Marxist language. Then we have the two different terms, the old left and the new left. And these two terms is used to differentiate from the, that group of scholars who are still using the traditional Marx language, that is the language which is strongly influenced by the Stalin version. And they use this, and they still strongly believe in socialism as a historical necessity for China to go and for the world to go. And they are the people that were still anti-capitalist. And about this group, I will be very brief, because it seems that they are not the most important element in this picture of anti-capitalist movement. And about this group, I will just say about three parts. The first is that it seems to be out of dated, and why? The second, that there's still revival. The third, that what's their special contribution to this picture? Very quick. They are outdated in two senses. In first sense, is that there is a very clear irrelevance of what they're speaking about and what we are doing now in China. And secondly, Theoretically and spiritually, they have been, they, they have already lost the battle in the controversy about what is the real version of Marxism <laughs> in the 80s and in the 90s with the introduction of the Western Marxist thinking into China, especially the humanist articulation of the spirit of Marxism. And so this is the side about the outer dated. But the other side <laughs> is that they are still there and there has become a recent revival of this voice. And what's the reason behind of this? The most important reason of this is the Chinese government's very clear awareness of the so-called crisis of ideology, especially among the young people. So the more the old left is believed as outdated, the more this awareness is becoming stronger. And this has made them got more resources and more support. But the most important is the third part. What's their special contribution to this picture? And their contribution could be articulated as the very stubborn belief in the scientific socialism, in the sense that it's a kind of necessity guaranteed. So it's a kind of necessity guaranteed by the so-called scientific law of the historical development. 
And the second part is the most important part, is the so-called Chinese new leftists. Unlike the old left, the Chinese new left has a big appeal since the 90s of the last century. And then we need to ask why. Why they could be so attractive to the Chinese uh, ordinary people, especially the young people. There are two ways for them to be so attractive. The first is that they're really talking about the real problem within this process of the development of capitalism in China. So they're talking about the gap between the rich and the poor. They're talking about the problem of the countryside that has been totally left out by the development in China. And they're talking about the emerging environmental issue. So with this, with this, they are the group that has been taken as the people who are really criticizing capitalism in China. So it's not the Marxist scholars, but these neo but these Chinese neo leftists. And on the other hand, they are attractive because they have been very open to all the new resources. They have been very open to the news, uh, to the resources coming from the Western left wing thinking, and they try to integrate all of this kind of thinking, like dependence theory, like the criticism of the late capitalism, and all of it was was integrated into the critique of the unbridled development of market as capital in China. So in this way, they self-consciously identified themselves as the critical intellectuals in China. And then what are the main criticisms that they have already contributed about capitalism in China? It's, it's of two faces. On the one hand, their main criticism is on the unbridled development of market capital in China. And they are, they, they, they are criticizing both in the domestic area and also in the global area. So anti-globalization is one of the important strong criticisms coming from them. And the other thing is that they are trying to give the answers. If capitalism, especially this kind of unbridled, unlimited development of capitalism, is something that really will drive the Chinese people into crisis, then what would be the future for the China to go? And they have, this is a loose group of intellectuals, and they have put forward two very reasonable answers to this kind of unlimitedness of capitalism in China. One, and both of them means to limit market, to limit the power of capital in China. But how to limit it? And on the one hand, they say that maybe we should, we should try to say that the government need to be responsive to limit the market. So many of these intellectuals has, has, has expressed them to be very disappointed about the government's unawareness of the importance of ideology. The, the other answer is try to limit the development of capitalism from the bottom. That means that economic democracy and all this stuff. And this is the second part. The third part is re revolt coming from the grassroots level. And it could be identified as neo-Marxist. But, but the main point is that it's a grassroots level in the sense that the theoretical thinking is lacking there. All the papers posted on the website Utopia is the beta criticism of capitalism, but is full of passion without very deliberate thinking. And the third part, uh, no, the final part is more complicated. Presently, we seem to have these two poles: the intellectuals on the above and the gross revolt at the bottom, and they are separated. But now they seem to be integrated. But they are integrated by the strong political power. So now in the southern part, in the, in the western southern part of China, we have a very important city called Chongqing. So in China, we have four important cities, Peking, Shanghai, Tianjin, and Chongqing. They belong directly to the central government, and they are as important as the provinces. And in this city, we have the so-called new political experiment of more East socialism. And in this version of more East socialism, they identify them to be the to be the continuation of the Maoist socialism. And with many of these socialists, they, they, they trust as a combination of peoples becoming rich altogether. So it's a direct response to the gap and socialist culture. But the, the most important part is that with this strong political power, now we have this altogether. So there has been two problems with this picture. One is how to 
really saw these two poles of liberalist and, and the new lefts. The other is how to solve the most difficult problem in the whole Chinese history, that is the relationship between the intellectuals and the political power. Thank you.